Again, let me welcome you. Let me welcome everybody to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here today. We have a fantastic guest and a crucial topic, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Now, we've been looking at open in various ways since the beginning of the forum. We've been looking at open access and scholarly publication. We've been looking at open teaching. We've been looking at open source software and demoing some of that. And we've also been looking at open educational resources. Indeed, it's possible that we've been chronicling and forecasting a kind of ongoing wave of open innovation. Indeed, perhaps an open innovation revolution where we switch to the majority of education being done in open ways. Now, one of the great luminaries in this field has been David Wiley, uh, a man who is so active, I feel he must be actually a conspiracy of three or four people at once. Among other things, he started off uh, Lumen Learning, which is a major enterprise for open education. He's been a thought leader in this field, a major activist, and someone that we always turn to. We want to learn where open is going. I'm always fascinated by his insights, and I'm just delighted to welcome him here to join us. So without any further ado, let me bring out to the stage David Wiley. Hello, sir. Hello. Thank you so much. Thanks for that introduction. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. R remind us, where are you coming from geographically today? I am in, uh, I just dropped in the chat box. I'm in sunny West Virginia today. Not Western Virginia, but West Virginia, which is a different state, in which occasionally Indeed. people uh, get confused about. Indeed. Indeed. Well, it's, it's lovely here, and we're just a couple hours uh, uh, east of you, so I suspect... Uh, um, whatever you're getting, we'll be getting very soon. Yeah, it's sunny and kind of 75-ish here today. It's just oh. terrific. Yeah. Let's just cling to that. Let's just cling to that. Well, thank you for deciding to be inside instead of outside like a sane person and, and talking with us. David, what are you working on for the next year? What are the big projects and the big topics that are top of mind for you? Ooh, for the next year, um, we'll... The, the main project I'll be focused on is a continuation of some work we started about two years ago that's uh, an ongoing project to eliminate race and income as predictors of student success in general education courses mm. in U.S. higher ed. So right now, on the first day of class, before you even show up to class, if I can find out something about you, you or your family's income level or something about your race, um, or both of those things, I can unfortunately make uh, way more accurate predictions about how you might do in the class than uh, we would all like to have be the case. So we've been for the last oh year and a half with some funding from the Gates Foundation working on a new courseware model Ooh. whose specific, actually whose sole design criterion is to eliminate race and income as predictors of student success. And so we, we just piloted uh, the first run at that uh, this past January. We had about, I think we ended up with about 75 sections across the country in an introduction to statistics hmm. course um, where the, the platform features as well as the content itself are designed with this kind of specific goal hmm. in mind. So we just released Intro to Statistics uh, in January, like I said, in the fall. Um, we'll be releasing Intro to Psych, Intro to Business, and Quantitative oh. Reasoning, and then we'll have several other courses kind of rolling out, but all with this design goal of how can we make it so that, you know, knowing anything about your race or your mm -hmm. income level it just becomes completely unpredictive, right? We just level the playing oh. field. And I, I, I think the language of leveling the playing field might be more it's language that you hear more frequently, but it doesn't have quite the sharp edge that I need it to have to, to understand mm -hmm. if I've succeeded in what I'm trying to do mm -hmm. uh, or not. So I'm very much a fan of this very specific language of eliminating race and income as predictors of success. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's interesting. It's almost perverse that you want to, at the end of this, have you remove a reliable predictor. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's excellent. That's like, what, What's this project called so people can find it? Well, the, uh, the, uh, the product, I would say it's more of a product than a project. The product is called Lumen One, uh, mm -hmm. O-N-E. Okay. And you can find it on our website, which is lumenlearning.com. You can, you can find the introduction to statistics course there now um, and the others coming in the future. Excellent, excellent. 
well, I look forward to using that class um, as soon as I can um, as a good demonstration of open learning, and but also this kind of design. That sounds terrific. Yeah, I'm actually teaching Intro to Business this fall using uh, the, uh, the Intro perfect. to Business release. So be be eating the dog food here. Exactly, it'll be dog fooding 101. Uh, <laughs> Well, that's, I mean, that sounds like an enormous enterprise and a very beneficial one uh, that could potentially scale up enormously. Um, and is that your, is that your main uh, project for the next year? Uh, yes. I, everything else I'm doing is falling under that, uh, falling under that umbrella. I see. I see. That makes sense. You know, the, the work we're doing around um, kind of developing new models of student co-design falls under that umbrella. Uh, the work that uh, I'm looking at doing in AI falls under that umbrella. Um, new work we're doing platform-wise in terms of enabling A-B testing and things like that falls under that umbrella. So there, there are a bunch of smaller pieces, but they're all kind of in the service of this broader goal. Very good. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I mean, uh, I have a feeling that right now, People are just going to be, you know, searching off on this and googling this, and and we're going to have to fight to bring them back. I think for our conversation, but but this is great. Um, what a wonderful project, um, friends! If you're new to the forum, what I'm going to do now is just ask our guest a couple of questions um, to get the ball rolling, and then I'm going to step back and make space for all of you to ask your questions. So as we speak, uh, think about what you'd like to uh, put to David Wiley if you'd like to ask him about. Uh, Lumen One, or if you'd like to ask, what about Open that you'd like to raise? I just wanted to uh, reiterate a point I made in my very quick introduction. Uh, it seems, you know, if we, however far back we want to date the beginning of Open Education, you know, maybe the 2000, maybe the Berlin Declaration, um, it seems like it's just been growing incrementally year by year. We have more and more projects, we have more and more content, a, a gradual kind of consensus that quality overall is improving. Uh, we've had some back steps, but overall it's just been growing and growing. I'm, I'm curious, will we be able to figure out when Open becomes the majority status of education resources? Uh, and when might we anticipate that to occur if possible? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the, I think you're right that things have been, certainly been growing in terms of the, the amount of content and the number of people who are participating. Um, so there's been a lot of growth that way. Um, but, you know, reflecting on earlier today, I was thinking about the conversation we're gonna have today and I thought, um, you know, I, I published the first open license for content in 1998 and then published what I mm. believe is the first academic book in uh, 2000 that's published under an open license. Um, and then you look forward to things like just thinking about bigger scale things mm -hmm. like flat world knowledge in 2007, mm -hmm. um, OpenStax in 2012, press books. Yeah. sometime around 2017. Um, there's a lot more participation and there's a lot more content, but uh, actually I think it's sort of disappointing mm -hmm. that there's not been a lot of progress made in terms of format. You know, the, the kind of book that you would grab today from mm. OpenStax is static words and text, just like the book I published in 2000, mm -hmm. you know, 23 years ago under an open license was. And mm. there's been a, there's been a real, uh, there are several opinions in the, in the OER community about the degree to which OER belong inside something like adaptive platforms or personalized homework systems. Or uh, when you look at the technology, when you think about the courseware technology of kind of the late teens into the 20s and now as you start looking ahead at what's happening with generative ai the, um, there's been a large segment of the oer community that said that's not for us what we're about is about resources that are free they're completely free and right. only free and if they have to be completely free then you certainly can't you know, have a uh, like a chat gpt tutor that's helping you along because you know that costs money per token to generate uh, right. responses and support like that or or uh, personalized courseware or adaptive courseware that has hosting costs and data security and maintenance and other kind of costs associated with it so um you just think about it, this morning i was thinking about how this real kind of zealous devotion to the resources being free 
in some parts of the community has stalled out the progress that we've made in terms of the effectiveness uh, of the resources. We haven't been able to bring other tools to bear at scale hmm. because a lot of those tools have costs associated with them. And there's you know some feeling that cost isn't compatible hmm. with the idea of, of OER. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I was just reflecting on that earlier today and thinking we've made tons of progress in terms of the number of open textbooks that are available, the number of people who are participating in creating open textbooks. But uh, at the end of the day, 99% of what's getting created and called OER is still the same kind of words and pictures in a PDF or in an mm -hmm. HTML page that, mm -hmm. that we were making at the end of the 90s. Mm -hmm. Or an EPO. So, yeah. yeah, so a lot of progress in some ways and very little progress in others, I would say. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, we've, in a couple of our discussions about uh, uh, recent developments in AI, the idea has surfaced that perhaps instead of or alongside of the black box AI produced by enormous capital intensive giants like Microsoft and, and, uh, and uh, Google, instead, we should have open source alternatives or Libra alternatives uh, that also then use for data sets uh, open or open license content. Uh, do you do you think that we ha is that in our future? And of course, when we're talking about AI future. We're often talking about like one week. But I mean, do you do you think that's uh, something we should anticipate over the next year or so? Over the next year or so, yeah. I mean, so much is going to happen in the next week, like you said today, right? Uh, just today or yesterday, Facebook released. Uh, a paper detailing a new model that looks to be significantly uh, more parallelizable than transformers huh. quite, quite a bit faster. Um, you know, th there are people proposing new models all the time, but this one out of Facebook, I think it's megabyte is actually the name of the model. Um, and you should be able to find a reference to the paper on, uh, you know, on Twitter or somewhere, but there's just, it feels like every day is a year right now. Um, you know, with what's happening in this space. the um, Once these models bring down the cost of compute, then there will be a lot more participation from, uh, you know, op the open source community. But when it takes, you know, when it takes months and $50 million to train a single base model, you just, you're not going to have a lot of, yeah. you know, a lot of kind of community yeah. coming together to, to do that. But... Um, I, I think that all the indications are that, you know, hardware is going to continue to get better. The models are going to continue to be more efficient, um, maybe be parallelized like this uh, new megabyte model from Facebook. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, it would be great if at some point, well, let's actually talk about this for a second. I started to say it'd be great if in the, if at some point in the future, there'd be base models that were fully open. Mm -hmm. um, but I think where the action really is going to be, at least for us in education, is in the work we're going to do kind of layering value on top of the base models, hmm. whether that's hmm. through fine tuning or whether it's through um, prompt engineering or kind of mm -hmm. real time injecting additional information to prompts using embeddings or something like that. It's mm -hmm. just so expensive to develop that base model. And to some degree, it's not clear to me whether we need a fully open base model or not because hmm. uh, is going to be the educational value is going to be added in the layers above that in the fine tuning if it turns out that that's necessary or in the embeddings and the prompt engineering um, because even if you have a model that's fully open um, if the data were all open and the code were all open the uh, the way it operates is just as black boxish as it is if you if you can't see the code um, you know the way that inference happens mm -hmm. the, the token prediction happens um, and it still costs money. Mm -hmm. to use. It's got to be running somewhere. Um, you know, every time someone asks a question, it's going to cost money to generate an answer. So, even if that was fully open from front to back, you there'd still be costs associated with using it. Um, and I just it seems like those base models are already so commodified. If you jump on Hugging Face, there are dozens, maybe hundreds of base models uh, that are already there. So. Maybe at some point there will be some, as this starts to slow down, if it ever does, maybe there can be some consensus around the base model that's kind of most useful for our use case here in, in education. Now I say use case like there's a singular one, but you know everything, I think our minds all immediately go to tutoring. But, yes. but just imagine, like, imagine if you had an advisor 
an academic advisor who actually knew all the policies, actually knew the handbook, <laughs> actually knew everything about every course he needed to take and what yeah. sequence they could be taken in. I just think there's so many, uh, so many applications across the space for us. Uh, you, you just said a lot uh, in in a few words, um, and, I, and no, no, that's why we why we brought you here. Uh, yeah. And we had a couple of quick questions. Um, one is uh, people asked what an LLM is, and that's a large language model. That's I'm a, sorry. Uh, yeah. No, it's, it's okay. I, I just want to make sure everyone feels uh, feels comfortable. We have um, a large language model, which is a recent version of AI, which we could talk about if you like. A bigger question was, what is a base model, and how do you distinguish that from what's on top of it? Oh, so the um, in when you think about a G, the GPT, the acronym, you're talking about kind of a the if you think about the the difference between GPT four and Chat GPT. Right. So GPT-4 is a, is a base model. It's a model that's not trained to do really much of anything except predict tokens that should come after each other. And so there's an idea with um, in, the, in this space of these kinds of transformers that they get pre-trained pre in a very generic kind of sense. And then there's going to be some fine tuning that's done afterward. Um, mm. so like chat G, the difference between GPT-4 and chat GPT is that chat GPT has been fine tuned to have a conversational kind of interface where you can ask and it can remember and respond and you can carry on a conversation as opposed to more of a one shot kind of interaction where you ask it one thing and you get a response back with, like with GPT-4. And then if you were to ask it, tell me more about that, it would have no idea what you're talking about because it, it hasn't been, it hasn't been fine tuned to perform that in that conversational sort of way. So the idea of the base model is just, you know, bringing in tons of data, analyzing it, being able to do some predictions of, you know, what character or what token ought to come next as you're stringing together uh, a response to a question or an answer to a prompt, like write me a poem or whatever that might be. Um, but the base model is good, is a good kind of general purpose model, but we don't tend to interact directly with the base models. We tend to interact with ones that are fine-tuned, like ChatGPT for a specific purpose, or like Khan Academy's Conmigo, which has been mm -hmm. tuned for that specific purpose of being, you know, uh, 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 of playing that tutorial kind of role. So you might think about, to, to use an example that will resonate with no one, and I don't know why it comes to mind. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you ever participated uh, when you were young, if you ever built uh, the the Pinewood Derby. Yeah. Kind of, you know, yeah. you had this block of wood yeah. and then you would nail wheels onto it or not or paint it or shave it down or do whatever to it. Like think of the base yeah. model as just being that kind of block of wood. And nice. you need to put you need to put the wheels on it. You need to put the weights on it. You need to paint it. You need to cut it down. Put the stickers uh, on. To your, yeah, stickers uh, for your specific purpose. Well, so far... Out of 65 people here, two people have found that, no, three have found that to be a great analogy. So it's not, it's not nobody. It, this, this is good. Okay. Um, I'm afraid I'm dating um, myself here. Oh, no. I've, and I've, I'm clearly just sprouting more white hairs right here. Um, the um, Well, first of all, thank you for that excellent, excellent answer to, to that question. And speaking of questions, we have a bunch of them coming up. Uh, and some of them refer to the uh, uh, project uh, Lumen One. And I want to make sure that everyone got a chance to uh, to put their questions out about uh, about this. And friends, we have more questions coming up as well. So uh, this is one from our dear friend, Phil Long, who says, what are the variables that influence leveling the playing field? Is there any aspect of selective disclosure or is this environment asynchronous? Oh, um, well, I would say that the hardest part about leveling the playing field is, well, let me talk about the, the opposite. The thing that's the easiest to do, and that uh, in in my I'm sure this is true for many of us on the call, in in my career, I've <laughs> done a couple of times, is say you've got some gap in performance between the group that you're trying to bring up to to the par with the other groups in your class. It's really easy to intervene in ways that improve everyone's performance, but all that does is slide the gap to the right. You see what I mean? So mm -hmm. you might improve the performance of underperforming students, but that same intervention also improves the performance of who the people who are previously high-performing students. So now we've just 
we've slid the whole gap upward instead of closing the gap. Mm -hmm. Right. So what kind of interventions really um, can have an outsized role on students who are underperforming mm -hmm. um, and help close that gap instead of shifting the, the just moving everybody, you know, up 3% or moving everybody up half a standard deviation or what it might be. Um, and that turns out to be, I mean, just improving performance in general is really hard. Um, improving it in this really targeted way turns out to be even harder, but it has to do, um, the, I would say the, the success that we've been having uh, with that has to do with really kind of engaging students, engaging those students who, um, who need the most support and involving them directly in the design process for the course material so that we're not designing for a generic student we're designing for I mean, right you can't you can't design a new book for every one student in the context we're working in now now the generative ai opens up some different possibilities um but for example in the introduction to statistics course you can easily imagine if you can remember back to the time if you've ever had a statistics class there are just so many example data sets that you encounter during statistics where you would find the average height of adult males and the average height of adult females and then compare them to see if they're statistically significantly different. And it's kind of hard to imagine an example that would be less engaging or less interesting than the <laughs> average height of people. And yet it comes up kind of all the time. And so in talking with students, um, you know, about the design of this course and kind of the data that we're going into it and the kinds of things they're going to be asked to do and the way they're asked to work. You know, we heard a couple of messages loud and clear, which was, we're not going to engage if it's boring. We're not right. going to engage if we don't care or we'll minimally engage. Um, those examples that you're talking about are awful. Like, great, give us a better example. <laughs> give me a better example and we'll go get it. Okay, well, how, how about Spotify streaming data? Like, who are the top streamers? Yeah for 2022 those are data that i care a little more about and are a little more interested um and don't ever i mean while we're at it don't ever just give me one data set give me two or three or four or five data sets i can choose from whenever i'm going to do some analysis because i want to work on something that's engaging to me and interesting to me um you know another thing we heard from students was all the time it happens that I work through whatever I'm supposed to work through and I listen to the faculty member talk and I still don't understand. So I just go hit YouTube and I watch random YouTube videos until I find somebody that, you know, that I can kind of relate to and who I understand. Um, but then every time I do that, I get lost and I wander off down these trails as we all do. You know, when we go out into the internet, you, you get a recommended video and then three videos later, you can't remember how you started. So, uh, you know, another thing that we've done in Lumen One that has been that there's been strong feedback from students about is don't just give me recordings of a single faculty member. For every topic that's going to be explained or every problem that's going to be worked in a video, have there be two or three or four faculty members and have hmm. one of them be black and have one of them be Hispanic and have one of them be white hmm. and have one of them more like this and another one more like that and give me real choice so that I can find the person who I relate to. They're all working exactly the same problem, teaching exactly the same topic. Mm -hmm. But they're each going to cover it you know, in a little different way and talk about it with this kind of example as opposed to that example. Um, so really having students involved, not like creating all the content, creating the course design, creating all the features for the platform, and then asking students what they think about it, but really having them involved throughout the whole process has um, led us to do some different things that are having some impact. Oh, that's great. I, sorry, just personally, I think that's terrific to have students play a constructive, co-creative role. Uh, I just what you've described this, well, why is it broccoli in the first place? And I realize I just need to ignore the chat box because I'm not keeping up. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like a meaningful okay. statement and I have yes. missed context. <laughs> It is, and 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 we will have a, a good question from that uh, from that brilliant guy in just in just a bit. Um, but yes, there's nothing quite like the surrealism of appearing in Medea Res. Um, but uh, but following up on this, we we have a, a question from our dear friend Steve Ehrman, who wants to join us on stage. So let's bring him up on the screen. Uh, and Steve is coming to us, I think, from uh, Maryland. Hello, okay. Steve. 
Hi, Brian. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Uh, great to see great. you. Um, David, I had, had two comments about different things that you were talking about. The first one was tutoring. Um, I was uh, uh, had the good luck to be able to sit down in a session um, of a course, full undergraduate course, where undergraduates were learning how to be learning assistants mm -hmm. in the in some course that they'd already taken, usually cool. a STEM course. And what I wanted to point out particularly was they were learning a how to build a mental model of what the student they were tutoring how they were thinking about this mm -hmm. and then using that mental model to try uh, both testing it and maybe advancing the students by asking the students something or um, uh, yeah well asking the student to do something typically what it was uh, so in my mind tutoring especially the kind that's gotten such you know I multiple sigmas or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, I think the tutor is always making a mental model of where the student is. And that's, as I understand it, fundamentally different from LLMs. Mm -hmm. And I so I think I, I have a problem mm -hmm. with applying the same word to two things that are mm -hmm. so completely different from each other. Uh, well, I, I would say that they're different from each other if you leave them alone. But um, say that you were say that you're me and the primary context that you're working in is a adaptive courseware platform where you have in your software, you have a model of what, what the students understand and what they know and where they are along each of the specific, you know, outcomes or concepts in terms of mastery. Mm -hmm. And then when I go to launch a student, when I say, when, when they get to the end and they say, I'm still confused, let me talk to the tutor. When they launch that tutor, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to send the tutor, my whole model of where they are in their understanding. So that when chat GPT or whatever software it is begins that conversation, it's gonna be, before it even says hello, it's gonna have from me, my estimates of where the student is in terms of their mastery of, of the different concepts. And it's going to be, I, I don't know how much you've looked into prompt engineering, but you can scaffold the kinds of interactions that the agent is going to have with the student, you can tell it things like, don't just give them the answer, prompt them for what's the next step. You, you can do quite a bit of scaffolding and then you can augment that scaffolding with additional context around where students are in their current understanding, what they have mastered, what they haven't mastered. Um, and I mean, we're all single digit number of months into trying to do this work. Um, but there is, there are ways to push context in back into the LLM as it's uh, like we'll just let's just say ChatGPT, but understand that I mean any large language model when when I say that there are ways that you can feed context about your understanding of what's interesting to the students, what the student is understanding, what they're not understanding. Um, you can feed all that context to it in a way that it will be responsive to as it engages in a tutoring session with the student. Yeah, I'll just say briefly, because I did want to bring up a different issue. Mm. I think there's still more steps to take in developing that kind of model that oh, are based sure. on student misconceptions, for example. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, the other thing I wanted to talk about was, uh, I'll be, try to be as brief as possible, Fine. Uh, closing the gap, uh, as you put it, and I would say while raising the playing field. This is a subject that a lot of people have been working on for 20 years and more. Mm -hmm. uh, and to encapsulate what I understand it, high impact practices are have been shown to be very important in raising the uh, playing field while uh, also narrowing the gap. Um, uh, learning pathways. Uh, it goes also not just to educational strategies, and I could have listed about five more, um, but also to organizational changes. Um, mm -hmm. For example, the infrastructure that would help manage open learning in a variety of senses, online slash open. Um, and I think uh, it's sensible to start by saying, in principle, these are the kinds of things that need to be happening uh, in order for the education to be better for everybody, 
to close the gaps and to be affordable at the same time. You need to be thinking about all three, all three targets. And then after you have, you know, however much of a model you want to build, then ask, how can OERs help this model work better? Um, and I think it, it provides maybe a different slant on some of these things, or at least a, a way to say these, the OER has become effective as part of a larger constellation of changes. I could not possibly agree with you more. Hmm. Uh, I, I think another thing that is to some degree holding back the OER community is um, at, at some somewhere along the way, OER stopped being a means to an end and became the end. Mm -hmm. um, where instead of saying, I have this pedagogical approach that I'm using, OER fits into it in this way. Like as I'm reaching into my belt of tools, oh, I'm going to pull out the OER tool now because I'm doing something that calls for that. Um, to the point where just we, we just celebrate whenever anyone adopts OER without even looking to see did it make an impact on student learning? Did it hurt student learning? Did it help student learning? I mean, the 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 empirical studies are, it's just what you'd expect, right? It, it's no significant difference is the vast majority of stuff in the middle and out on the end, you have some that, there's some that show improvements in outcomes and some that show, um, you know, that outcomes suffer. But um, I, I'm kind of, I'm a little confused at, at this point now. And I admit 10 years ago, I was caught up in it myself and it's taken me a little distance to get to where I am now. But it's like celebrating the fact that somebody adopted one textbook over another, it, it's not all the things we need to be thinking about. I mean, it's great. It's 100% amazing saving students money is so wonderful. And if you can say, if you can get the same outcomes for fewer dollars per outcome, yeah. then we'd call that a win normally, right? But then when yeah. you go back in and look at outcomes, when you look at the four year graduation rate in 150% time, the way the Department of Ed tracks it, how many, what percentage of students complete their four year degree within six years? What percentage of community college students complete their two year degree within three years? That number is about 30%. Mm -hmm. We made it more affordable for 70% of people to never complete their degree. Ouch. Like, making it more affordable can't be the end goal. And yet I, one of the things I think that's holding that community back is that, that it, saving money has become the goal. And so our eyes are kind of off the ball of the thing we ought to actually be caring about, which is student learning, student outcomes, completion, you know, the effect of completion on their life after school, mm -hmm. things like that. So I, I, I think that's what you were saying, Steve. And if it wasn't, I apologize, but I, I can't sing that song frequently enough or loudly enough. So amen to everything with that whole line of thought. Well, thank you. Thank Thanks. you, Steve, for uh, starting the choir going. Um, <laughs> and uh, everyone needs to read Stephen's book uh, as well as to look at his uh, appearance on the forum because they're both excellent. Uh, and David, thank you for that excellent, excellent answer. Um, friends, if you're if you're new to the forum, you just got two examples, one of a Q&A question and one of a video question. So please feel free, again, that white strip in the bottom to press either button for whichever is, is best for you. Um, David, I, I want to uh, clarify and redeem the name of the uh, broccoli asker, uh, which is a sentence nobody on earth has ever said before, so I feel pretty proud of that. I love um, and this is, uh, we have a, a typically great question from uh, Tom Hames, uh, who, was, who was mentioning that. I just want to put that on the screen for you here. How much does the very concept of going to class have to do with success based on economic class, which is closely tied to race? Isn't the system stacked against you? The system is stacked against you. I mean, some of these issues are systemic, right? And there's actually a paper that I just saw yesterday. If you'll give me just a second, I will pull up the reference and drop it. Sure. In the uh, in the chat here, making the claim. This is a study with twenty eight thousand students in it, and here's the link in the chat. Uh, <clears throat> and here's the kind of here's the key takeaway: class attendance 
is a better predictor of college grades than any other known predictor of academic performance, including scores on standardized admission tests like SAT, Whoa. high school GPA, study habits, or study skills. Class attendance is a better predictor of success than any of those things. Now, some of those things are just wow. terrible predictors, so it's not a very high bar to mm -hmm. clear. Mm -hmm. Like the SAT is just not a great predictor. Yeah. Um, but just you asking about class attendance um, just made me, you know, think of think of that question from yesterday. But um, wow. but yes, there are there are absolutely structural problems that keep people from, especially particularly physically, from getting to class. Right. Um, could you put the question back up, Brian? I feel like I. Oh sure, of course, of course. Um, it, it's a it's a deep one. Um, how much does the very concept of going to class? have to do with success based on economic class, which is closely tied to race, and isn't the system stacked against you? Yeah. Um, that's a yes or no question. So I'm, I'm just going to say yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. it, 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 it's stacked against you in so many ways. And um, we, we have a chart that we use when we onboard new employees at Lumen. Mm -hmm. And it's a pie chart. And about 99.5% of the chart is one color, and then a very narrow sliver of it is another color. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the message that goes with that chart is, here are all the things that need to happen to be able to dramatically improve student success with very high probability. And then there's an arrow that points to the little sliver that says, this is the part that we work on. Oh. Oh. There, there's food insecurity. There's yeah. housing insecurity. There, I mean, there's just so much that students are swimming upstream against. Part of it is, you know, part of it is the cost of their course materials, and a, a bigger part of it is the effectiveness of their course materials and the degree to which those materials, you know, implement best practices and are, are really going to effectively support them in their learning. But um, you know, but we we use this kind of exaggerated pie chart just to make the point that as a like course material provider, there's so much we can do, but there's only so much we can do, right? It's why the, it's amazing that there are things like the FAST Fund out in the world that give mm -hmm. small grants mm -hmm. to people. There's, mm -hmm. there's a whole ecosystem of problems, and there has to be a whole ecosystem of solution providers. And um, you know, this project that we're working on now where we're trying to eliminate race and income of predictors of student success, I'm very curious to see how much of that gap we can close. I would love to imagine us completely closing it, but there are a lot of other things that, uh, structural things that impede students. So we'll see how close we can come to it. You know, a, a funny side note here hmm. is that when we received this grant from the Gates Foundation to build a brand new platform, adopt, and adapt OER into that platform, et cetera, to all the things we were funded to do. There is a separate grant given to Digital Promise to run a nationwide uh, RCT to evaluate the effectiveness of the thing that we built hmm. uh, or the thing that we're in the process of building. And it just goes to show how incredibly difficult it is to run kind of nation level RCT type of research that the grant to Digital Promise is actually bigger than the grant to Lumen Learning was. Wow. We're building a brand new wow. platform, all this kind of, right, doing all these things, uh, you know, paying these groups of students at institutions around the country to participate in these co-design sessions, all the things we're doing, it actually costs more just to run the RCT to figure out, did we or did we not, or to what degree did we actually manage to eliminate race and income as predictors of student success, so. Well, wow. well, this also speaks well to how to, to how effective and efficient uh, Lumen is, I would say. Uh, thank you. Yeah, there, there's uh, there are there's a primary benefit of using OER and then there are multiple kind of secondary benefits to using yeah. OER. But, you know, dramatic increase in improvements in efficiency, I would say, is definitely one of the one of the benefits of using OER. To my mind, the primary benefit of using OER is that it makes it possible for you to engage in continuous improvement cycle after cycle based on data 
that students and faculty generate in their use of the courseware. So say for to make it make it easy, imagine that there are 15 modules in this courseware. And in one of these modules, I can see that students are consistently engaged with all the interactive practice. They're looking at the feedback, they're going back and practicing again, they're watching the videos, they're doing the homework. Um, I've interviewed their faculty member and I know their faculty member is doing the in-class active learning activities that we that are prepared and that come as supplemental materials, et cetera. The students are doing all the things we're asking them to do and they're still not learning or they're not learning at the level we want them to. Yeah. That tells me that our materials aren't good enough and I need to improve them. Right? And so if the materials I've adopted are OER, I have permission to you can say revise or remix or however you want to think about it. I have permission to make changes to those materials that can help them be more effective yes. next semester than they were this semester. And that to me seems like it's the most important reason, um, at least from Lumen's perspective. That's the primary reason that we use OER. We love the fact that it helps us keep the cost down as well because there aren't royalties to pay and things like that that a traditional pu publisher would have to to deal with. Um, but I actually think the continuous improvement part of it's more powerful. But you've got, uh, well, thank you. Thank you. That's, that, that, that is so powerful. And I can think of some stories where that's occurred. And by the way, this is just a, a shout out to uh, Alan Levine, who is on, on this call. And Alan has a, a project. Dog. Yes, indeed. He's an ongoing project of, of, uh, of great stories about uh, success using open. So just a shout out to him, a uh, great person. Uh, we have more questions coming up, but I want to make sure that that, that uh, everyone gets a chance to handle them. And these these now focus more on uh, on OER uh, per se. And here's one that's coming up from um, Ray Garcelon. So what do you think are the current barriers, major barriers to OER adoption for faculty institutions? And are they different from the major barriers from five to ten years ago? Um, yes, they are different. I think five or ten years ago, the majority of faculty never heard of OER and you mm. can't adopt something if you've never heard of it. Um, I think now more people have heard of it, and I would say that now the major uh, barriers to adoption are, um, say I teach college algebra, and um, I currently use whatever product, you pick a product, it's in the $150 to $200 range, but the main thing that it does for me is it automatically grades student homework and it saves me from all weekend long hand grading all the homework problems that all my math students have done. And then you walk through the door and say, hey, there's this thing called OER. It's amazing. You get five R's. There's open pedagogy. There's all this stuff. Um, and it's going to save your students a ton of money. But now instead of them paying, you're going to pay because you've got to go back to hand grading everything you were doing before. Well, that's just, that's not an adoption pitch that is ever going to work. Um, so you yeah. have to put OER together with these homework systems or with some kind oh, of adaptive perfect. platform or something like perfect. that. F faculty don't want to move backward in you know, the support that they're receiving currently from traditional uh -huh. publishers. Uh -huh. They're getting quiz banks, they're getting PowerPoint slides, they're getting pacing guides, they're, get, they're getting all of this material, plus support for grading, plus in some cases, they, they might even be getting like some dashboards that are showing them uh -huh. Uh -huh. marginally useful data, giving them some insights about what's happening in their class. And if the pitch is stop doing all of that, stop having all of that done for you and start doing it all by hand, and you can adopt you know, this OER, then um, people just won't do it. The, the vast majority of people won't do it. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. you know, the reason that Lumen exists is because we came out of a, a two-year grant back in, what well, this has been from 2010 to 2012, where we, uh, my friend Kim, who's my co-founder and I, and some other people were trying to support faculty in making this transition from, TC, from traditionally copyrighted materials to OER, TCM being the opposite of OER. And what we heard over and over and over again was this is too hard because publishers used to do all these things for me. And now you're telling me that I have to do all these things for myself. Yeah. And so you know, 
part of part of the reason that Lumen exists is we realized that if faculty were ever going to adopt OER, somebody was going to have to do the work of providing all that supplementary supplementary material, mm -hmm. assessment mm -hmm. banks, PowerPoints, in-class active learning activities, blah, 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 plus the platform that can automatically grade the homework and can post the grades to the learning management system and all those other things. But it doesn't need to cost $175. Right, it costs. It's going to cost some money. In Lumen's case, it costs thirty-five dollars, um, which I think is a steal. But I'm biased, clearly. Um, but I and I think that you know, coming back to the point that uh, we were talking about at the beginning, if your view of OER is that OER in its OER needs to remain pure in its unadulterated form and be unaffiliated or unassociated with anything that has costs then you really are swimming upstream trying to tell somebody who's used, you know, a Pearson MyLab for the last six years and now switch to this PDF that's free for your students, but comes with no support for you. Um, so I think the barrier to adoption now is, is that finally getting back to the, the, the question, right? Is providing those supports and tools and the dashboarding and the other things that faculty have come to rely on and, thankfully actually started to make some use of finally well that's a that's a great answer um a daunting answer and ray thank you for the great question it reminds me uh, i asked the uh, head of the company that owns elsevier the scholarly publisher um if if what business he thinks he's in and he says he's in the data business not in the pdf business mm. um, which which is very very telling uh, it's had a yeah. lot we have uh, more questions and only seven minutes to go. So I want to make sure we all get a chance to, to pop these off uh, from uh, Giselle LaRosse, who I think hopefully is coming to us from New Orleans today. Um, uh, she asks, for me, it seems that what's missing in the context for DIY learning or homeschooling for adults, what if OER is a front runner to larger systemic change? Um, I think that's, so as a person who, for some number of years in our family, we've homeschooled all of our children for some number of years before they've transitioned mm -hmm. um, into either a brick and mortar or, a, or an online. Mm -hmm. um, I'm super sympathetic to this kind of view. And I do think it's possible that, I wouldn't think, I would, I would say it a little differently. I would say, and I saw Cable's uh, name blow past in the chat there a minute ago. Cable had a dime for every time he heard me say this, he could retire. I, I think that, content is infrastructure mm -hmm. right and so when when you're going to create a new course when you're going to create a new learning tool when you're going to create a large language model when what whatever you're going to make um it builds on top of content and you can go acquire very expensive content that you have absolutely no rights to and try to build things very in a very brittle way on top of that or you can acquire open content that lets you do all the things that you need to be able to do and really helps you get faster, further, less expensively. And really importantly, when the infrastructure is open, it lowers the cost of experimenting. Right? So more people can try more things. More and and we can't depend on, you know, the four or five whether it's the four or five biggest uh, software companies that are creating AI tools, or it's the four or five biggest publishers that are creating content, you, you just can't depend on four or five big anything to solve any problem. That's not how it's going to work. The solutions are going to come when they're, or they're going to come more dramatically more quickly when there are thousands of experiments running in parallel, right? That's how you're going to, you're not going to find solution by doing five things. You're going to find it by doing a thousand things. So how can we make it less expensive, less risky, faster to engage in those experiments? There's a great quote, which I will mangle a little bit, but I'll get it close enough that, uh, that people can find it if they're interested. Hmm. Thomas Torvalds once said about the Linux operating system, and hmm. said, don't ever make the mistake of thinking that you can design something better than what you get from massively parallel trial and error with a feedback loop. That's hmm. getting your intelligence way too much credit. <laughs> we, we need this massively parallel experimentation, trial and error. We need yes. people you know, engaging in all these experiments. And when the content 
uh, that you want to do that with is freely available to you to try the thing that you want to try, then it's a lot easier to go and do that experiment that you wanted to do. Well put, well put. And I'm glad that you can do some of that work at scale uh, through Lumen. But we only have a couple of minutes left. Um, we have uh, another question that comes in, uh, and this is from Ed Finn, Valparaiso. He asks about the digital divide. Do you feel the digital divide adds another layer to reinforcing socioeconomic barriers for students? While OERs may be free or low cost, if they can't access them, does that matter? Will you, can you leave it on the screen? Of course. Yeah, give me give me one second. I'll extend the time for which, it. Which not knowing shindig is, is actually is the question I meant to ask. Can you leave it on, on the screen? Uh, say yes, I can. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm doing so. Um, I mean, the digital divide, of course, adds a layer here that is um, that is reinforcing some of those barriers. But there are people, you know, Lumen doesn't do this work like I talked about a minute ago. There are lots of problems that students are facing. There are lots of people working on solutions to them. I don't work on the digital divide problem, but there are people who do, and I love the fact that they do, and they, they're they doing good work. Um, I think we all wish that that work were coming along faster, uh -huh. that everybody's, everybody's doing the best they can. Um, of course, if you can't access the materials, they benefit you exactly zero. Um, so you know, this problem of providing access, like, do you really need a phone first experience because the majority of students that you care about are on a uh -huh. phone, maybe don't have a laptop or don't have, certainly don't have a desktop or in, they're not able to stick around the lab long enough on campus or, um, you know, what's the, what does a phone first experience look like? And that's not an experience that, you know, major publishers are, are building right now. So those are, you know, something that is, if not phone first, is at least highly responsive, is the kind of thing that you would do if you were trying to say, eliminate race and income as predictors of student success. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Wow, that's a good point. Uh, thank you for your uh, clarity um, and, and directness there. Um, I have one last question here from, the, from my side before the clock completely runs out, um, which is, uh, what are some of the emerging forms that open may take or may enable if we all start taking open more seriously? That is, if we go beyond what you said, okay, we've saved students money, yes, this is good. If we go beyond that, um, do you think we should see more and more projects like Lumen One? Do you think we'll see more of that kind of distributed feed, parallel feedback loop? Uh, what are some of the other um, new things we should be expecting? Well, really, I think the, the feedback loop part of it uh, that you mentioned is, is really the main kicker. Um, there, educational research is so full of frameworks and theories and models, and um, all of which are synonyms for opinions that have never been empirically validated. It, might sound hard to believe, but it really is true. I was taught so many instructional design models as a graduate student that why would I use this one instead of that one? Mm -hmm. Well, because that one's Merrill's instead of Reigluth's. And well, but when we create instruction using those two different models and put them in the field, who learns more? Why would you do that kind of stuff? <laughs> you know, they're like, there's almost like a, an, just a, a lack of curiosity around empirically validating the work that we're doing. So, um, you know, I mentioned A-B testing very quickly earlier. Maybe make, let me make another little plug for it here. To the degree that a lot of the things that we're doing are digital, uh -huh. it becomes, um, becomes pretty easy to employ some of the tooling that honestly we would borrow primarily from like the e-commerce or the digital marketing space. So think about all the tools, think about all the things that Amazon does in order to maximize the, the dollar sign next to your shopping cart before you check out. Now think if you were to apply all those tools in an instructional context and what you're trying to do was maximize the number there next to your name in the gradebook on that exam that you just took. Okay, so it's an optimization problem. Mm -hmm. We're testing lots of things. We're and, and A-B test is just another name for a randomized controlled trial. It's uh -huh. just an RCT. Uh -huh. That's the gold standard in education research, according to the Department of Education, is the RCT. So much of this happens digitally. 
why aren't we more curious about how well things work at all? And then when we find that something's maybe not working very well, instead of just blindly swapping it out with something else, why not also A-B test that new thing and see if it's actually an improvement over the one you had been using before? I wonder if it's because so many of the educators and academics involved are from the humanities. Um, and this kind of social science approach is often not part of their lives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I should say too, hey, BFA, music. So I'm, 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 I, I'm admittedly a little weird in that regard. But, um, but I, I do think that there's, a, there's just, there's not a culture of, there's not a culture of validating. There's not a culture of, even though, even with the emergence of the idea of the kind of scholarship of teaching and learning, you, there, you only see that really taking root in a couple of disciplines. You don't see yeah. it kind of yeah. happening broadly. Yeah. So I think if people, if we could help faculty be more curious about what's working for their students and what's not, and feel some ownership over that themselves, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I just think great. that kind of mindset would unlock so many things and OER would be so useful in the kinds of things that those faculty would do once they had that mindset. Yeah. But giving them the OER and not helping them develop that mindset just gets you cheaper textbooks that, you know, are going to result in the same kind of poor outcomes that we're getting right now. So maybe that's one of the revolutions we can expect is that kind of, you know, deeper curiosity, as you said, and awareness of, of, uh, of how these tools actually assist or don't assist learning. Yeah. Uh, David, this has been fantastic. A, a blizzard of an hour with so many ideas. What, what's the best way to keep up with you these days? Is it through uh, open content on Twitter or through the Lumen website or where? Um, yeah, either open content on Twitter or my LinkedIn. I generally cross post. Um, but yeah, either of those would be, would be fine. Very, very good. Well, thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you for all the work you do. And, uh, we look forward to hearing what, uh, what, the digital promise thinks about, uh, what Lumen One has done. Yeah. Well, check, check back in the spring of 2026 and, uh, you know, we'll have an answer, but I want to thank you too. Thank you for the invitation. This has been super fun to see so many folks I haven't seen in such a long time and, um, My pleasure. It's been fun. Thank you so much, Brian. Oh, thank you. Thank you. But don't go away yet, friends. Um, I just want to, first of all, second that uh, uh, David's delight in all of you. I completely feel that myself. If you want to keep talking about these issues, again, you can at uh, open content on Twitter and at me, Brian Alexander, uh, or you can hit me up on Mastodon. There's my long URL. And just use the hashtag FTTE. Uh, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions where we've covered some of these topics, including AI, including open education, including the educational change, just go to tinyurl.com slash FDF archive. Uh, if you'd like to look at our upcoming sessions, which do touch on assessment as well as college teaching and teaching with AI and campus economics and more, just go to forum.futureofeducation.us. And above all, thank you all for thinking and sharing so much today. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, I hope all of you are heading into June with, uh, with uh, a lot of happiness and uh, delight. Uh, I hope all of you are safe and sound, and we'll see you next time online. Take care. Bye-bye.